Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can all see me and hear me. And I welcome you very warmly to the kickoff of the Partners e Humanities and e Heritage webinar series. And today we will feature the webinar with the title Create Impact with your e Humanities and e Heritage Research with Juliana Stiller and Klaus Doden, who you can see already, and I will introduce them in much more detail in a few minutes. Um, I'm totally thrilled that so many of you have um, entered uh, the webinar and are very eager to hear from our experts what they have to say about creating impact. Um, first, I have to do a bit boring, but nevertheless necessary part to explain to you a little bit more um, how the webinar works for those of you who have not participated in this format already. Um, so as you have probably noticed, uh, you are muted uh, during the webinar um, and you can also not be seen uh, via the camera, but um, you can always use uh, the chat for questions and remark. The chat window is on the right side uh, below of the webinar screen. Um, we will try to collect uh, your answers during the web uh, webinar and we have uh, prepared a lot of time um, to answer um, your questions uh, after the presentation. In case you cannot hear me already but see me um, or you have any sound problems, please uh, check your technical settings and to be able to hear me, um, you have to click on the speaker symbol um, on the top of your screen so it has to uh, be green. Um, that's all uh, for housekeeping. Um, whatever happens in the next one hour, um, please help us to improve uh, our series. We will send you a link with a short feedback survey. Um, before I introduce the trainers, um, I would like to introduce um, the project partners um, of whom I am uh, part and who uh, set up this webinar series. Um, PARTENOS is an acronym and it stands for Pooling Activities, Resources and Tools for Heritage, E-Research, Networking, Optimization and Synergies. Now that's a very long title and um, to uh, keep it short what um, Partners as a Horizon 2020 project is aiming at is to strengthen the cohesion of heritage related e-research and it started in 2015 and it will run until 2019. Uh, Partners is a very international project. Um, we have 16 partners in around nine European countries and um, the coordinator is uh, seated in Italy. It's called PIN. Um, the whole series is a cross partners training effort, so different um, members of partners are involved uh, in this series. And we are especially delighted to have been able to um, uh, invite uh, and participate experts to, to help us um, to give uh, also presentation. Um, yeah. And coming to our experts for the kickoff, um, it was uh, I was terribly um, happy to find uh, Juliane Stiller and Klaus Toden to um, uh, act as trainers uh, for this uh, webinar because they are uh, experts uh, in this field. And um, I just um, won't read the whole CV, which is very impressive. But I want to say a few words um, about uh, each of them. Um, so Juliane Stille is a researcher at the Berlin School of Library and Information Science at the Humboldt University. And um, she is very much into evaluation of solutions for cross-linguist research for bibliographic metadata for the project called CLUBS. And um, even more, she is the chair of the Daria EU Working Group on Impact Factors and Success Criteria, about which we will also hear a bit more during the webinar. Um, last but not least, uh, about her professional or educational background, um, she obtained her doctoral degree in information science 
where she evaluated interaction in cultural heritage digital libraries. So that's about um, Juliane. And the second trainer is um, Klaus Toden. And Klaus is a research scholar at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, um, also at Berlin. And um, he is a Magister Artium in German language and linguistic, uh, and also from Humboldt University. Um, at the moment, I understood he is a technical coordinator for the Edition Open Access, which is a publishing platform for hybrid open access publications. Um, yeah, that's um, all about um, our trainers, and um, I very gladly hand um, over now to them. Yes, hello from us, everyone, and hello from Berlin. We're just waiting to get the slides up. So um, Klaus and I are sitting in Berlin, and um, we would just like to know where you are from. We have already some pe people from Colorado in the USA. I wonder what time and is it there now? Hmm. Uh, Stockholm? Bochum. Bochum. Greece. Australia. Ireland. Was there Australia? Yeah. Um, okay, so we have Germany, we have Europe, we have USA. Great. South Africa. Wow, I'm impressed. So all people are coming from all over the world. So thanks so much for participating. Um, so, and another one from Madrid here. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And um, we are going to start now with a webinar. And we are talking about how we can create impact or how you can create impact with your e-humanities and e-heritage research. And um, first of all, to set the scene a bit, if you think about the normal research life cycle um, that you go through during your research, then um, you would normally start with developing your research question, you plan your research project, you um, collect your data and carry out your research, and then you analyze your data, you publish your results. And when you create impact, then you often would say, okay, while publishing results, I create impact with my research. But nowadays, with the uh, digital environments, we are able to create impact throughout the whole research life cycle. We are able to publish results throughout the whole research life cycle. And this is about what we would like to talk with you today. As I said, the scholarly workflow is changing in terms of um, in terms of the digital environment we are working in now. So the information infrastructures we use are changing. The research objects um, we are looking at and we study are changing. The way we link knowledge is changing. The way we collaborate, the spaces in which the research takes place, the research results we publish are changing. And uh, Klaus will talk much more about this. Then the way we disseminate results, because the research output is so different now, and the way we measure impact and much more. To dive a bit deeper into what this all means. So before, we used to have infrastructures like the library. We still have it now, but it was very traditional you know, to go to a library and find your information infrastructure for your research there. Now. You would have um, digital research infrastructures such as Clarin or Daria EU, 
um, where you are able to store your research results, where you are able to use digital tools. They offer you the infrastructure to do digital research. In terms of research objects, we have the classical book, um, which you might have been reading or studying. And nowadays, we have a digital text, right? And you are able to apply uh, much more automatic methods with it. When we are thinking about how we link knowledge in the old analog days, we might have, oh, we might have used uh, footnotes. And uh, nowadays, we have the linked open data cloud, for example, where we are able to link knowledge um, and link entities of knowledge together. This allows us also to create uh, new research results. We are moving from the lone researcher, which is kind of a cliche, to more collaborative work. But um, this will also take place uh, in rooms together, but also virtually across uh, countries, as we can also see with this webinar. So we are able um, to be at the same time, but uh, still be, uh, work together at the same time, but still uh, be in different places. The spaces. Um, where research takes place are changing. So if you were studying the David of Michelangelo, um, you would probably need to go um, to the actual statue. But nowadays, you can also study it from um, your place at home with um, technology, which allows you to actually look at um, the David statue in ways you are not able to when you are just standing in front of the uh, physical statue. The publications are changing, and Klaus will talk much more about uh, this in a second. So from traditional book publications, journal articles, and so on, we are moving to enhanced publications, where we are actually able to um, also publish the underlying data um, with your um, publication or even publish other publication or publish other forms of output for example in this case you see um, a poster or you can publish slides and we can consider this scientific output okay. the methods are changing from um, just doing something like closed reading. We are moving to uh, digital methods, which are very manifold. But just uh, to give you here an example, of which, looked at, um, which looked at different dramas um, of European literature or even world literature, and assessed um, the main characters and how often they occur together in a scene. And uh, they did a nice visualization of all these different dramas. And you are able to see patterns you might not have been able by uh, just reading all these dramas. The dissemination is changing. So this is also um, pretty obvious. We are moving from not only disseminating our um, output through journals and uh, through monographies, but going to social media. So we are twittering about what we are doing. We might blog about what we are doing. We put um, pictures in the internet when we are going on a conference. And this all is, has also a big Im impact on how we are measuring impact, either of the researcher and also of uh, the work we are producing. So the traditional impact factor is still relevant, but um, we are adding much more impact factors. And just to Name one, these are the article level metrics, which are um, getting more and more important, where we also look at particular article of a scholar and see how many PDFs don downloads, how many HTML page views there are. And we are also able to um, see the social media feedback a particular article or a particular scholarly output is getting. So and all this um, is relevant because um, these are all the components which um, will factor into the impact you are creating with your research. And in this webinar, we will particularly look into um, the impact you can create 
by using enhanced publication forms, by disseminating your research output widely, and by communicating the benefits of your research to different stakeholders. And now we would like to ask you, um, yes, you can see probably all now um, a poll. We would like to ask you what kind of publication form you used in the scientific context. And please choose three different um, answers here, and I will give you a bit of time. So we have here traditional publication forms, such as a book or a journal article, a conference paper, but maybe you also um, published a digital tool or some other piece of software, like a um, visualization tool. Did you publish a data set before? Did you write a blog post about your research? Did you publish a presentation, for example, on SlideShare? And I think we cannot see the poll anymore. Yes. Ah, OK. Sorry, I think you have to give your answers again. There was a little technical hiccup. OK, and maybe one, some of you also um, published some annotations. OK, I give you a bit more time. It's very interesting. Huh. So more people for now did actually publish a presentation than published a journal article. This is very interesting. OK, now we close the results. And we can see that 76% of you actually published a scientific presentation. Only 50% published a journal article, a bit more a conference paper. We have um, book publications by one third of you. OK, but it seems that you are already well aware of um, different, different publication forms and uh, different ways of disseminating your research output. OK, and I will now hand over to Klaus, who will give you more insights into enhanced publications. Thank you, Juliana. So hello, just trying to prepare everything. So I'm mainly talking about changing the way we publish. As we have already seen, in the computational and digital humanities, um, we are employing new forms of data. We have new methods that we can use. Um, and also, we create new forms of output in that um, respect. As you can see on the left hand of the picture, this is uh, a workplace of a colleague of mine who does the uh, electronic edition of a manuscript. And he has his all electronically set up um, his workspace. And on the right-hand side, you can see a new form of data that is uh, being published, which is um, um, a Neo4j database interspersed with the um, interpretation of the whole data set. And what you can see is an interactive query in the article itself. A very interesting way of publishing results. So what you can see um, is that with the new research methods and the new forms of output, you also have the ability and the chance to document uh, everything much more better than before. You can document the methods you used, the data sets that you used, and also which tools you used, and also the parameters that you uh, manipulated the tools with so that you can actually um, then give your audience um, a very uh, reproducible way how do you did the research. And this makes the whole process of the things you did much more transparent than you ever could before. And um, 
this is a very good way to actually interact with not only the publications that you put out in the end, but also with the data that you aggregate during your research. So we have come up with this scheme, which also incorporates the research life cycle, but we have also some preliminary phases here, um, the exploration and the publishing event in the end. And we sort of um, thought about what are the results of these different steps, like if you explore the field that you're working in, then you might come up with, with research questions, you form hypotheses, and through the corpus creation, you actually get a corpus, which you can then interact with. And um, in the third column, you see what kind of externalization or materialization these forms of research create. So you have notes in the beginning, you have a array of corporal things that um, determine your um, body of research. And in the end, you get presentations where you talk about your work. And in the end, then publications about the whole thing. Um, so the way it works now is that um, these forms of output also form a very valuable source of research, not only for you, but also for your colleagues in a way. However, um, traditionally, it has been seen that for these kind of more data-centric publications, there's no real incentive to publish them, and there's no reputation if you actually um, publish a database that is uh, the body of your research. And also, it is uh, regarded as too precious to publish, because this is what you can then exploit in, in other publications to actually um, get your career going. And um, so these are things that might restrain you from publishing the data. However, since most of us, us are working in a more project-based content, there is um, often a point in the way the project works that um, you are rushing towards the end and you don't have really the time to actually clean up your data and publish it in the end so that this sort of gets stuck and you never really publish the data and don't give it away for for reuse. And this is something which um, we should think about and uh, Julian already ta talked about um, using um, open repositories like uh, the ones from Daria or Claren or Zenodo to actually give out the data and make it uh, available for reuse. The reason is that um, we need to embrace the new technologies like the internet. You can see here a very impressive visualization, a map of the internet in, in the years 2003, 2010, and 2015, which is sort of an ever-expanding web of webs and clearly the um, humanities research and their data has to be part of the web and it needs to be discoverable in there. It needs to be also um, natively integrated into the web and because it forms a very variable resource. So we need to embrace the internet and explore the new ways of publishing by offering more of the content of the humanities research as web pages and, and open standards like XML, HTML, to remove the boundaries between the resources. So if you think about a, a book or its electronic counterpart, a PDF, then this is, is much more a, a data island than really connected to um, the whole um, web and exploring it as a graph and to interconnect sources between each other. Um, and you get much more fine-grained ways of citing things on the internet, like we've seen in the Perseus example, which Juliana showed shortly, that you can really assess and access each different word in, in the corpus and, and really talk about it and annotate it. And speaking of annotations, you can... Um, the browser is a very flexible and customizable um, working environment because you can uh, extend it with plugins and um, use annotations on every 
um, web page that you find and uh, explore that with your scientific community, for example. And also, when you think about moving away from, from the paper resource, you can uh, adapt the sources that you're using and the material that you're uh, reading to the different media outputs. Um, I've given you some example from my field of work, which is a, a book that came out last year, which is um, available as an uh, HTML source on the internet, as you can see here, but also we have a PDF version of it and uh, um, an ebook file that you can put on an EPUB reader. And this is all done from one source and you can actually satisfy three different markets with um, one source. And this makes it a very powerful tool of um, sharing the content that you're um, building up. Um, so I would like to show you some three more examples of um, how we would like to interact with um, the different materials that uh, have now been digitized in the past few years and that are made available um, open access most of the time and put into repositories um, and can be explored and can also be integrated into um, your own research like this 3D scan of a clay tablet with cuneiform writing on it. And you can use the browser, for example, to actually modify the view of it, and you can rotate the, the clay tablet. You also have the static view on, on this side of the screen, but actually you can interact with this, and you can also download the files. And um, I don't know if it's possible in this example, but it should be in the near future possible to also download a file that you can send to your 3D printer that most of you will have at home and actually create a model of this one tablet and um, to play around with the physical object then and your own copy of the physical object. Um, we have in our collection very high resolution images um, that can be explored with uh, uh, image viewer, which you can use to zoom in very, very deeply into the material and you can manipulate um, the sources, you can add bookmarks, you can also add annotations and share that with your colleagues or integrate that into your publication. Or a very impressive thing, which is now very much uh, taking up speed, is the ability to intertwine a scientific article with programming code, which you can not only execute while reading the article, but you can also modify um, certain parts of the script so that you can actually see what um, really made the, the graph in this example for here. Because here are some lines that are being um, made by this or another piece of software which is higher up in this article, but you can actually um, change the code and, and view the results um, on, on the fly in the browser. And also a very um, interesting thing is our friends over at Partners, they are developing um, a new platform for scientific communication which is called the Partners Hub, which will also be a platform where you can uh, also publish your research data in, in a traditional way, like articles or documents and papers. But also you can integrate blog posts or posts in social scientific networks, which are um, basically a very volatile medium but in this case, um, they are being uh, frozen, they are being put into a repository and are a fixed set that belongs to this publication package. And all of this is then citable and put into a long-term preserved repository and can, be, and can then serve as a, a new way of publishing your data. So all this means that we need to be aware of how this new research output creates impact 
and what that means for the assessment of researchers and their work. And to support you in that, we accumulated the list of impact factors and criteria that allow you to communicate the benefits of your research to stakeholders. And we will present that to you in a minute. But before we do so, we have another poll coming up. And this time we'd like to know which of the following impact factors you find most important to assess the impact of a researcher. And Ulrike has put up the poll and uh, you're welcome to make your choices. So everything is still a bit in flux, <clears throat> but it seems that the majority of you um, really aims at the number of citations you are getting. And behind that is the numbers of publications. And the third point would be the number of downloads, which I think would be this. Uh, the number of downloads of an article. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for choosing. And now we're going to the third part of the seminar. Juliana will be talking about um, the impact metrics. Yes, I'm. I'm very surprised that still so many, or so many of you, value the number of citations as a um, impact. Factor. That's really interesting. And maybe we, later on, after um, my last slides, we can discuss this a bit more. OK, so let's move on to, to the meaningful impact measures and um, why it is important that we talk about it. Because um, the whole research life cycle is changing. And this also changes how our output influences change in certain area and how we as researchers um, should be evaluated in terms of the impact we are creating. So <clears throat> traditionally, impact of scholarly work um, is determined by the number of publications, the number of first authorships, the number of citations, the number of third party funding or the number of PhD students. And uh, as we could also see in the poll, all these things are still very um, important and um, probably also at the heart of many researchers. And it's still something uh, people look out for when they probably um, look at the work of others. Or if you try to find a job, this is probably that's still very important. Mm. But um, yeah, why is impact so important? Because um, you as a researcher, but also people who are employing you, or also the society, they want to know the value of your research, the value you provide for the scientific community, but also in um, other areas different from research. Also the value for the society um, you are creating with your research. And um, particularly for the humanities, you probably um, want to be able to um, know and express how your research is impacting practices in the humanities and um, probably also driving uh, e-research or digital humanities further. Um, it's very important to understand um, impact in the areas in which you can have impact because um, you can count the number of your citations and you can count the number of your publications, but it will also increase your visibility and transparency of your research results if you are able to um, express your impact in other areas uh, than the quantitative publication measures. And um, this is um, even more important because it enables you to communicate benefits of your research to other researchers, to funding ag agency, or to stakeholders um, you are working with. And it will streng strengthen the influence of digital research in the humanities as uh, one field of the humanities. 
So why, what is impact? Um, in, in a project in Daria DE, we were working on impact in digital humanities and we tried to gather um, many different definitions of it. And this is what we distilled for us as uh, one definition of impact or as we would like to see what impact is. So impact is a certain change in an area and um, there are factors which influence this change or these factors um, are important to obtain impact in a, in a given area. And you can actually measure and evaluate the change you create through certain criteria. And the change you create or the impact you have can be negative or positive. What is also important with it are the user requirements, um, which should be al aligned with um, the impact you are creating. And if user requirements and the impact you are creating are aligned, we can say that you were successful. Or often um, you are assessed as being successful when the impact you are creating and certain user requirements or um, conditions apply, then you would be considered successful. Um, next to the impact definitions, we also gathered impact factors and success criteria from literature and stakeholder surveys, and we defined or we got out of it 21 impact areas. Um, we also looked into the success factors which influence change in these areas, and we mapped them um, to the criteria which measure change in selected impact areas. You can find this gathering um, of impact areas, success factors, and um, evaluation criteria in the so-called impact matrix. It's hosted on GitHub, and you are very much invited um, to have a closer look at it. Um, so how can it be helpful? So if you publish and disseminate your results, and I'm not only speaking about your, um, your results in a publication, but also other output you might be creating, then you can use the impact matrix as a starting point for your uh, publication and dissemination strategy. You can identify the areas in which you want to have impact, um, and then you choose the factors that influence the change in these areas, and you can use the criteria as key performance indicators to actually assess if you were successful with your strategy. And once you are successful with your strategy, you can communicate this to stakeholders. To make this a bit clearer, I give you an example. So for example, imagine you have a visualization tool you created during your research workflow, and it helps you to visualize your results. And um, you want to make um, this tool sustainable and open it up for the community. So you are looking for impact in the area of sustainability. Now you can use the impact matrix and you have different factors which influence uh, the area of sustainability. And you pick the ones which uh, you can adapt for your visualization tool. Not all of them apply for everything, but um, it gives you some kind of guidance of what points you have to think about. And these factors for your visualization tool would be, for example, that you have an open source offer. So you um, offer it as open source. You will document your functionalities and you will document your code so that uh, other people can actually work with it and uh, use it. Um, you make your tools uh, tool scalable and you look that um, other people can plug in modules so that it's um, extendable and you want to use and support standards. So if you do all this with your visualization tool, you probably create impact in the area of sustainability. How do you measure that now? So um, given the factors you choose, you can think about um, measuring the quality and extent of the documentation. So how good is my documentation? How well can others work with it? Um, have I created a documentation for every feature which is in the visualization tool? And uh, you could also look at the reuse of code because you have an open source offer. So for example, you could um, look at the GitHub forks. 
but also look at the quality and extent of the open data format. And these three things um, could be the starting point for your key performance indicators, which are very, very important uh, if you want to communicate to funders, for example. Um, to recap this, so here you have um, our understanding of what impact is, and if we now look at the impact area sustainabilities, then the factors for your uh, visualization example tool would be the open source offering, the documentation of functionalities and code, the scalability and modularity, support to open file formats, and the criteria in, with which you measure the impact or which you measure the change you have in the area sustainability would be the reuse of code, the support of open data formats, and the quality and extent of documentation. And all this can be used to write funding applications, and it's very, very helpful for this, actually. This was just an example of one of these 21 impact areas for which we um, collected factors and criteria from the literature, and we hope that you can find this hopeful to look more into um, the areas in which you are creating impact. Three takeaways from all of this would be, first of all, it changes how, when, and what we publish, right? There will be not only a publication, but there is much, much more on the way to the publication, which um, will be a research output and which needs to be disseminated. These new and enhanced publication forms Klaus was mainly talking about require new dissemination strategies. So your traditional publication can go, in, uh, can go into a journal or you make a book out of it, but uh, your data set needs uh, different dissemination channels, for example, a repository. And if you are able to link all your research outputs within one research cycle, that would be actually ideal. And the understanding um, of the impact of your research output will increase your visibility and success. So really think a bit out of the box and not only in terms of the amount of publications you are creating or the amount of uh, citations you are accumulating because um, there is much more um, work or offerings or impact you can even create for your community. And if you are interested in impact and want to uh, learn more and sit together with experts on impact, then I really invite you to uh, join us in Berlin for the Daria EU Impact Workshop. Um, it will take place on the 21st to the 22nd of June, so two half days at uh, the Berlin School of Library and Information Science, which is uh, in, at the Humboldt Universit uh, Universität in Berlin Mitte. Um, participation is free of charge. More information can be found on the following URL, and uh, there you can also find the link to register. And then I thank you. Yeah, thank and you good. very much. Um, this was very, very interesting. And, over and I think again. there are a lot of questions. Um, I had an eye on the chat in between, and I um, already uh, transferred a question to you. And, uh, read it already and um, getting set up for um, answering the first question. Um, as a kind of uh, promotional jingle, I am just uh, wanted to show the, the next um, webinars to give the trainers also a time. Um, uh, to make up their mind. But uh, I think um, I would say we just uh, start with the first um, question and we will be um, keeping a note uh, and an eye on the chat when you type other questions. At, uh, during the um, webinar, there came already a question um, from Jeff, and he asked, uh, or he said that uh, he thinks that web pages are really great for research outputs. 
but he constantly runs against problems of sustainability. So if you have any recommendations for how to sustain research websites um, after project money expires, um, that would be great if you could elaborate on that. Yes, thanks for the question, uh, Jeff. Um, there are some issues that we might consider um, when archiving web pages. I think the most secure technology would be to actually use mainly HTML when you have such a great setup of very many different pages because we don't know where different web frameworks and such things are heading to, so this is really not the best way to um, archive things where we don't know what will be the state of um, technology in, in five to ten years, so we have to actually go down to the basics in terms of that. Um, on another layer, you could surely um, use virtual machines to actually save the state of your platform or the research um, site that you've created and then you need to find a host which is going to serve that. And I think um, Daria, for example, offers virtual machines where you can archive projects or at least um, um, take your research data to and into a repository. Um, I think the most secure way is to actually refer to standard technologies and standard file formats to, to um, store your data. Yes, and I, um, I also think that uh, the not availability of uh, research websites from projects which passed away is uh, really, really annoying because, I mean, a lot of uh, research output happens in projects and it's just... Uh, really annoying that these web pages and the publications which go with it are most of the time gone. But I see that also the EU is making progress with it and uh, the funders are requesting um, a data management plan which goes beyond the project lifetime. So I, I hope we see more improvements over mm. the coming years. Um, thank you very much. Um, the discussion is also continuing a bit in the chat, but I think um, Jeff uh, seems to be um, quite uh, happy with the advice you gave. And a new question um, came in, which I think is also very interesting. So, um, Frank, thanks you very much for this uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. And he is actually wondering whether this new methods of dissemination you have been talking about aren't as relevant for traditional means of publication. So you're not only Twitter about uh, a GitHub package, but also um, about uh, traditional journal publication. Yes, I, th I think that um, the dissemination uh, applies to new research output and old research output, right? We can use the new dissemination ways for old research output and um, vice versa. Yeah, it's yeah. just a matter of uh, getting across what you've done, what you've done in your research. And this is um, a very up-close approach uh, for, for doing for tweeting your horn. It also depends on the audience you uh, want to reach, right? If you want to reach uh, fellow developers, um, then you probably should go where they are to st stake overflow or mm. something. And um, yes, if you want to re reach uh, traditional scholars, then you probably also should, should put something in a journal or go to conferences. Also, still very important, right? Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
think the the new doesn't replace the old, so it all has to go um, hand in hand together. Um, let's take up another question, um, which came in from Raul, and um, it's actually asking regarding the impact, if you know if there are any developments to work on domain-based impact factors. He remembers uh, the president of the New York that he wrote in a newspaper about it. I'm um, not is there I'm aware of, but I know to... there are some impact people also here as participants. Maybe they know. I would be also very uh, keen to get the link on this uh, newspaper article. <laughs> so if you want to share it, Raul, that would be great. Um, yes, I I wouldn't know of domain-specific impact factors. If that means impact factors just for digital humanities, for example, I suppose that, that this is meant by that. OK, thank you very much. I hope uh, Raul will um, connect with us with the link to this newspaper. And uh, probably that's also a topic for um, your upcoming workshop. Um, I take up the question from Daniela, um, who asked about advice how uh, traditional or libraries in general um, should approach uh, the collection and facilitating of dissemination of new forms of publication. I think that's uh, also a big issue for the library um, sphere. Is there something mm. you can say about that? Not much, to be honest. I think it is a question for policymakers because um, um, just thinking about, I mean, the traditional or like uh, scientific libraries, they collect books and everything. If they are now also uh, need to collect uh, GitHub repositories and code, this will probably um, put them in a position where they would need a whole new infrastructure. Um, I actually do not know about libraries uh, which do that. Yeah. But this is something that um, virtual research infrastructures actually take over when, when they offer their repositories where you can um, store your data. Um, and if they have search interfaces or interfaces to expose their data, then I think the libraries would just need to take up um, plugging into the uh, search um, and data harvesting. OK, thank you um, very much again uh, for your answer. I think this is a very, very broad topic um, for um, all of us and can probably not just be uh, solved in this uh, discussion time um, we have, but we will also take it uh, into account um, as a topic uh, for us uh, to continue the discussion. Um, I think we can take uh, one more question. Um, there was another question, but uh, that's, uh, I think, more related to the work of Partenos, um, which uh, cannot be so easily answered by um, Klaus and Juliane. Um, there was a question if Partenos has a specific policy or program um, that addresses the needs uh, and interests in ear search for independent system, citizen scientists um, who are tended to be seen as a crowd for nameless, faceless tasks. Um, I don't, um, that's a very um, interesting question, and I'm very sorry that I cannot answer it. It's definitely um, not who how I see citizen scientists. Um, and uh, if you can leave your email address about that, um, I definitely would like to delegate um, this question to colleagues and uh, partners who are able to answer this question. 
So that would be really great. Okay, I see you there. Um, maybe you just leave a contact and then uh, send me an email afterwards so we can come to this question. Well, are there any more questions, one more question to uh, Juliana and Klaus? Okay, I think the, the question seems to be answered um, at the moment, and, and um, I'm very much uh, looking forward to um, the, the follow-up. Um, we uh, will definitely um, have an eye uh, on the chat and uh, look if we uh, overlooked um, any questions, and uh, we're also thinking um, with uh, Juliana and Klaus to write a, a short follow-up uh, uh, blog post article um, where we will address uh, in short the uh, questions and we will also so, um, make the slides uh, available so you can uh, recheck the links and we are also looking at um, how we will uh, be able to share the webinar recording with you but uh, that will uh, maybe take some time so bear patience with us and um, have an eye on uh, um, the partners uh, social media activities and uh, I will um, also send an email to you when the uh, recording um, is available at least to the registers, uh, registered um, participants. Um, yeah, so um, I am have a few minutes left and I would like to uh, use them to first of all thank you um, for joining us and to thank very much um, Klaus and Juliana um, who have uh, um, given a very interesting presentation and uh, um, made us think a lot about uh, new ways of publication, new ways uh, of dissemination and also um, how we have to work on uh, changing the system if we want to um, make those things uh, happen and also being counted um, for our uh, research output so that we not are getting stuck in the stage of uh, counting only citations to journal articles. Um, we have uh, prepared a feedback uh, survey um, which I would be very grateful if you could um, fill it in to help us improve um, the webinar series. So the link is already on the screen. Um, I will also send it to you in the um, in a follow-up email to the registered participants. So um, from my side, I see already a lot of thanks and goodbyes um, in the chat. Um, it was uh, really a pleasure with you. Um, and uh, I think the first um, webinar um, was a great. <laughs> Um, great success uh, and um, I'm really hopeful to see some of you back in the next webinar uh, of the series. Um, I announced it already. The next webinar will be next week with uh, Marie Purin and Klaus Ilmeier. It's our um, part of the um, Love Data Week, uh, which happens next week, and they will um, talk about uh, fair data and standards, and actually they will be looking into finding the devil um, that is in the working uh, collaboration with research infrastructure. So um, we there is always a saying, the devil is in the details, and uh, many of the details are actually re related to uh, standards and um, working in a sustainable way. Okay, so um, yeah, that's uh, all from me, um, Juliane and Klaus, if you are still able to say something. Yes. Um, Thanks for I, having us, it was yeah, a pleasure. It was great. To you. For me, it's that was our first webinar, we enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> thanks for everyone for being so active here.
Yeah, thank you. Chat. Next time. Okay, then thank you very much. And you can actually, the participants um, can just leave the webinar room by uh, closing the Adobe Connect um, application. <laughs> we cannot Bye. throw you out or something. Um, so you have to leave voluntarily. <laughs>